I'd like to talk about vegetarian diets and diabetes. Um, first of all, um, you're looking at disclosures. Um, I have received no financial or uh, in-kind support for this presentation. Um, I do uh, declare one conflict of interest, which is that I write books and I sometimes get royalties from them um, and uh, have no uh, industry funding. And in order to mitigate any bias, I'm going to do my best to present <coughs> studies fairly and to make the references available for any studies that I cite. Um, I might mention one other source of bias, which is that I grew up in Fargo, North Dakota. I don't know how many of you have been there or seen the movie, um, but all of the dietary guidance that I'm going to provide this morning is in somewhat conflict with my own past. Um, I'd like to start out in Japan, uh, and the reason I want to talk about Japan is when we talk about diabetes, so many people will say, the problem in diabetes is sugar and anything that turns to sugar. So don't eat bread, and don't eat pasta, and don't eat beans, and don't eat potatoes, and don't eat rice. Well, if you look at Japan, what is the dietary staple of Japan? You eat huge amounts of rice, breakfast, lunch, dinner, rice, all the time. And if you look at diabetes prevalence in Japan in adults over the age of 40, before 1980, diabetes was quite rare, 1 to 5% of the population. Now, what happened in Japan right around 1980? Okay, yes. As uh, my friend Bill Castelli from the Framingham Heart Study always says, when you see the golden arches, you may be on the road to the pearly gates. Um, it may, may be true. Uh, meat came in. This is not traditional Japanese food and the fat content of the Japanese diet went uh, up quite dramatically. Not as bad as ours, but it went up. And carbohydrate went down. Less rice is being consumed. And if you look at overweight, you see uh, a difference by gender. For women, there wasn't a lot of change, really for social reasons, cultural reasons. Women are, were not out of the home so much, but men were eating at fast food places and having business lunches, and men started gaining weight. So what happens if you have a population? eating more fat and gaining weight. What happens to diabetes? Well, by 1990, it was 11 to 12%. And this shows us two things. The first thing is that diabetes is not primarily a genetic condition. There are genes that are important, but environment looms large. Secondly, rice does not cause diabetes. Um, let's take a lesson from the United States. Uh, meat consumption has gone up dramatically, especially in the post-World War II period, uh, especially chicken. Americans eat more than a million chickens per hour. Imagining this to be health food. That's right. Yes, this will be on the test. Um, let me say a special word of condemnation for cheese. Back a century ago, cheese was a European thing. Americans couldn't get through four pounds of cheese in a year. But fast food chains and pizza restaurants have escorted cheese into our diets as never before. The problem with that is it's 70% fat, mostly saturated fat. It may smell like old socks, but people have gotten hooked on this very much. And it has escorted fat into our diets like never before. Uh, sugar, there are many different types of sugar, but the top line here, the red line, shows total sugars. It's not your imagination that's gone, gone up as well. So if you go back two decades, and you look at Fargo, where I grew up, or Montana, Minnesota, less than 4% of the population had diabetes. Louisiana and Mississippi in disgrace at 6%. But as meat went up and cheese went up and sugar went up, uh, as the years go by, here's 95 and 96 and 97 and 98. And diabetes doesn't wait. As the diet changes, the map changes very quickly. In 2006, I'm going to change the colors because we are zeroing in on counties. But we've seen the same progression of the disease. OK, uh, who does better? Uh, researchers have studied Seventh-day Adventists uh, because they lend themselves to study very well. As a population, generally speaking, they are asked to not smoke and to avoid alcohol and avoid caffeine and avoid meat. And almost all Adventists are very good at the first three of those. Um, so you have a, a health-conscious, non-smoking population. And in 2009, the American Diabetes Association published these data looking at body mass index in nearly 61,000 Adventists. And they split them into five groups depending on the diets that they followed. 
And the first uh, bar is what they called non-vegetarians, typical meat eaters. And their BMI was not below 25, where we'd like to see it, but it was 28.8. And the next group was semi-vegetarians, meaning people who ate meat but less than once a week, a little bit thinner. The third group was the folks who ate fish but no other meats, and they were somewhat thinner. And then the ovo-lacto-vegetarians, the green bar. And finally, vegans, and I have to remind my patients that a vegan is not a person from the planet Vegas, <laughs> uh, but simply a person who, who avoids all animal products. And they happen to be not only the slimmest group, but the only group whose mean BMI was right there in the healthy range where we'd like to see it. But this is not why the ADA published these data. They published it because of diabetes. And there you see this dramatic gradient that the more the animal products are gone, the lower the prevalence of diabetes. And, and whenever I present these data at scientific conferences, I can just hear the audience saying, wait a minute. Yeah, those vegans have only 2.9% diabetes, but they're probably better educated, more physically active, they're thinner, they're probably more wealthy, and so forth, maybe so. So let's adjust for BMI, age, sex, ethnicity, physical activity, and other factors, and you still see that there's something about the diet that has quite a powerful effect on diabetes risk. So my team in Washington, D.C. decided to put this diet to the test for people who had never done anything like that before. We brought in a group of women all after the age of menopause, all moderately to severely overweight. And we asked them to follow two guidelines. The first was no animal products. And the second was to minimize added oils. And we did not ask them to limit calories or limit carbohydrates or limit portions. We asked them not to change their exercise pattern. So all they're doing is two things, no animal products, keeping oils low. And it was a 14 week trial. And the menu looks rather liberal when you present it to the patients. I can have blueberry pancakes, no pat of butter, but I can drown it in maple syrup if I want to. Uh, oatmeal with cinnamon and raisins, and if I have chili, it just has to be the vegetable chili. And if my linguine arrives, instead of the meat sauce or the Alfredo sauce, it'll be topped with artichoke hearts and seared oyster mushrooms and chunky tomatoes and that kind of thing. And at 14 weeks, the average person had lost 13 pounds, uh, two inches off their waist, and their insulin sensitivity measured by glucose tolerance was significantly improved. And we tracked them for two additional years against a control group following the National Cholesterol Education Program diet, a chicken and fish diet. And we found that although the control group gained back their weight, the vegans uh, never did. And they were skinnier at two years than, than at baseline. Uh, we recently published a meta-analysis looking at every study we could find using plant-based diets for body weight. And if you're to the left of that, that zero line, that's the, the right-hand line there is the zero line. Every single study is to the left of that line. And what that means is that every study shows that when you put people on a plant-based diet, they lose weight. It's, it's predictable. Um, so then we did a follow-up study, and I want to tip my hat to David Jenkins, who helped us with uh, in the design of this study, where at this point we did a study in individuals with type 2 diabetes using an intervention that was vegan and low fat, but also low glycemic index in this case. Uh, we had a control group following what were the ADA guidelines at that time, reducing calories, keeping carbohydrate limited and relatively even from day to day. It was a 22-week trial and a one-year follow-up with 99 participants. And we had no dropouts at all in the first 22 weeks, which doesn't mean everyone followed the diet perfectly. It means I got a needle in everybody's arm uh, at 22 weeks. And at 74 weeks, we had 86% uh, compli or, uh, per continued participation in the vegan group and 90% in the ADA group. And the first thing to present is the A1C data which fell in both groups about 0.6 in the control group following the ADA guidelines and one full point in the vegans. And this is not a significant difference between the two, although both groups did well. There was no untreated control. Um, however, there's a huge problem with these data, 
as anybody who treats people with diabetes with intervention diets knows, which is that your phone rings about four days later with hypoglycemic patients. Um, they have been treated with insulin or sulfonylureas. You've now improved their diets and they're, they're hypoglycemic, which forces you to reduce their medications, which introduces a humongous confounder. So now I would like to present the data on individuals who did not make any medication changes at all, either because they were treated with diet alone or metformin or something else that didn't cause hypoglycemia. And here you see something remarkable. The drop in the control group in A1C was 0 0.4, which is, a, which is a nice drop in A1C. But the average reduction in A1C in the people on the plant-based intervention was 1.2 absolute percentage points, which is impressive. Uh, when we tracked them after a year and a half, uh, the control group got back to baseline, and the plant-based group never did quite get there, although you do see some loss of their gains. Uh, when we look at body weight, both groups lost weight, and it's not a significant difference between the two. What is remarkable is that although the ADA group was asked to cut calories, the vegan group was not, and yet they lost more weight. Um, and, and by the way, the reasons for this is not rocket science. You're eating foods that are lower energy density because they have less fat in them and more fiber in them, so weight loss tends to occur without a person intending it. Uh, LDL drops as no big surprise. You're not eating cholesterol. You're not eating animal fat. Um, so we recently published a meta-analysis on every plant-based uh, intervention study we could find looking at its effect on A1C and there's the zero line in the middle, and as you can see, every study uh, looks to improve uh, hemoglobin A1C. So the effects are quite um, striking. Um, how does this work? What, what I just said is that people were eating rice and beans and spaghetti and, and high carbohydrate foods with no caloric limit, yet they lose weight, their cholesterol goes down, and their diabetes gets better. And so I'm asked this quite frequently, and I find myself drawing on the back of a napkin at the airport for the person who's asked me this question, uh, what's going on in the body as best I understand it? Uh, let me share this with you, because I also share this with patients. This is a muscle cell, which is the site of insulin resistance, of course, also in the liver. And the glucose is trying to get into the cell with the assistance of insulin. And so the insulin key will attach to that receptor and signal these receptor, uh, the cell to open up to receive glucose. That's what's supposed to happen. And a person with type 2 diabetes has insulin, and they've got receptors, and the binding is fine. There's no problem there. The problem is inside the cell. And when I was a child, there was a favorite trick that some of the neighbor kids played, which was to put chewing gum in the locks of other people's houses when they weren't home. And you would arrive home, and your key would no longer open your door. Well, you don't have chewing gum in your cells, but what you do have is fat that is accumulating inside the cell and stopping that insulin key from being able to function. And you can think of this as accumulated beef fat and chicken fat and fryer grease getting in the cell. Uh, now, it's the, the situation is somewhat more complex than that, but not a lot. And as that fat accumulates, insulin resistance worsens. So how much animal fat is in a vegan diet? Well, there isn't any. And if I keep vegetable oils low, that fat very likely starts to dissipate. And even though I'm not counting calories and carb grams, the fundamental issue in type 2 diabetes is being addressed by the diet, which is this accumulation of fat. Now, doctors hate words like fat because it has one syllable, so we'll call it intramyocellular lipid, but that's what we're addressing here. All right, this is Vance. Vance was uh, a policeman in Washington, D.C. His father was dead by age 30. Uh, Vance was 31 when he was diagnosed with diabetes, late 30s, uh, began the vegan diet, lost 60 pounds, stopped his diabetes medications, his A1C dropped from 9.5 to 5.3. Um, which is good A1C to have. Um, and when I asked his permission to share his findings with you, he said, make sure you tell everyone that my erectile dysfunction went away as well. Um, that's, he's smiling, I see. Um, this is Nancy, similar situation. She lost 40 pounds, stopped her diabetes medications. Her A1C dropped a lot, although she's still in the diabetic range. Uh, her arthritis improved, effectively went away. And if any of you are interested in why would a plant-based diet improve an inflammatory process like rheumatoid arthritis, um, I'd be glad to talk to you about that, uh, that later on. But in, my guess is it has to do with removing dairy protein. 
Um, so when we prescribe the diet, there are three steps that we use with people who have type 2 diabetes. It's vegan, it's low in fats and oils, and it's low glycemic index. And we give our individuals the power plate, fruits, grains, vegetables, legumes. And we actually sent this to the US government in 2009, we, the Physicians Committee. Didn't hear back from them. Uh, so we filed a lawsuit in 2011 to compel response. And I don't know if you saw what the government came up with in 2011. This is called my plate. This is US government policy. I'm, I'm taking no credit for this, but it looks somewhat uh, similar to what we sent them a couple of years earlier. There is no meat group in US guidelines. There is a protein group, which could be meat, but it can be nuts, and it can be beans, and it can be tofu. Um, the dairy group includes soy milk as well as cow's milk. Um, the, the last thing that I would like to talk about today is how the heck do you prescribe this? Because many, many patients will say to me, I do that in a minute, but my family's gonna divorce me, I'll have to live in the garage, I don't know how to make this work, da -da, I'll never get a lunch date again, and, and doctors are afraid to prescribe it. So we have developed a way that breaks us into two steps and I have never seen anyone unable to do it. And I'd like to describe, for any of you who are clinicians, how to work with patients on this, because it's very easy and it works better than, than other diets. The first is invite the patient to just check out the possibilities. For the first week, you do not ask the patient to make a change. They're just checking out the possibilities. You give them a piece of paper that says breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack, and ask them to try out different foods. So for breakfast, if they haven't had oatmeal since they were a kid, now is the time to cook it. And if they've never tried almond milk, let's see how that is. And then for lunch, I never had a pizza without cheese. Will that work? This week, we'll try it. Uh, try the veggie dogs. All they're doing is testing out the possibilities. And they go to an Italian restaurant and discover that they're happy to make them a full meal that's entirely without animal products. Same thing with Mexican cuisine. The bean burritos and the veggie fajitas are fine. Uh, Chinese, even easier. Um, they're a little bit wedded to their bottles of oil, but it's quite easy to do the vegan part and you can negotiate about fat content. Uh, extra points for Japanese because it's very often quite low in, in fat overall. Uh, when the person goes to the sandwich place or the, the taco place, this may not be the pinnacle of culinary art, but there are plenty of choices that the patient can try. So after a week, they come back in with their sheet all filled out and they said, I've got my breakfast and lunches and dinners, and at that point, you go on to step two, which is let's try a three-week test drive. All vegan, all the time, three weeks. At the end, the patient will do it because it's only three weeks. At the end of that time, what they discover is number one, they're healthier. They're losing weight, their blood sugar is down, they're feeling better. Number two, their tastes have changed, which they were not expecting and you didn't tell them was gonna happen. But you remind them, do you remember when you switched to skim milk? At first it was kind of watery, but you sort of got used to it. And then if you ever tasted whole milk again, what was that like? Oh yeah, you're right. I don't like that anymore. It's too greasy. When you lighten the diet, the first week on a vegan diet, it does feel light. You're gonna think, I've got to acquire a taste for folk music now. Uh, <laughs> break out the tie-dye, okay, I'm vegan, swell. The second week, it starts to make sense. And you discover there are lots of websites and books and products all over the store that are kind of cool. And you discover there are many celebrities and former US presidents and their vice presidents doing exactly this diet. And it's, it's a lot easier than you thought. Um, and then we also never give a patient a diet and just send them home. We always schedule a weekly class. And I just want to show you quickly how we do it. Uh, it can be taught, taught by a dietitian, a nurse, a physician, a health coach. I like to have at least 10 patients because if it's fewer than that, they feel they're under the microscope a little bit, but not more than 20 because they get lost. And you can mix diagnoses, diabetes, dyslipidemias, weight issues, doesn't matter, it's all the same intervention. And uh, we have a curriculum that I will give you for free at pcrm.org, you can download it and, and, and please use it. Uh, the agenda starts with a weigh-in. The patients come in and they are weighed privately by a female staffer. And we, we always do that just because we've learned that a lot of women don't like having a man look over their shoulder at the number on the scale. Um, and then for the first half hour of the group, they go around the room and each one describes their successes and their challenges. I lost three pounds, but I got a wedding next week. And the other group members say, well, what can we do before we get there? 
And then the second half of the group, we do some kind of education, a video, a PowerPoint, or something like that. And again, we have a whole series that we'll give you for free. Um, we have additional materials, the nutrition guide for clinicians. We give to every second year medical student for free. Um, we have nutrition CME. Um, we have an online program called the Kickstart, in which every day you get an email for three weeks with menus and recipes and cooking videos and a free app. There's no commercial sponsorship for this and there's no charge. It's in English and Spanish and Mandarin, and we have one for people from the Indian subcontinent and also have recently started a Japanese program for this. We have had 430,000 people go through these various programs. Um, and lastly, I would invite you to come to Washington July 31st when we are at our most sweltering. We would love to have you come to our International Conference on Nutrition and Cardiovascular Disease where we'll talk about the origins of heart disease in childhood, perhaps in utero. Um, and maybe just w one quick word. Um, I, it's very important for us to be specific. When we talk about diabetes, it's not about eating right and exercising and avoiding sugar. It's going to a plant-based, healthy diet. Exercise is good, but that alone is not going to eliminate the diabetes uh, thing. Avoiding sugar is a smart idea, but that alone is not it. That's like saying lung cancer is all due to radon. Some of it is, but there's a lot bigger issues that we've got to deal with. Finally, it's really important that we make noise. A generation ago, we dealt with tobacco. And the tobacco industry was big. And we were afraid of it. But my hospital finally made the decision that we were going to ban smoking in the hospital, which we did, biting our lip. And within two weeks, we knew we'd done the right thing. And every hospital and every restaurant and every business, every government building has done exactly the same thing. Today, that's where we are with food. We're fooling around with it, knowing we've got to do something. But if we take action, we can win there too. It means being specific, giving the, our government ministers the the cover that they need, they need to say doctors want this, that's the reason we're doing it. If we do that, I'm convinced that we can win. Thank you very much.